My research is all focused on plant-associated bacteria, but through this I've uh, come across the story of a phage-derived toxin in a particular uh, plant-associated bacterium. Um, so in terms of these bacteria, mostly I look at them from the phylosphere environment, so this is going to include all of the above ground portions of the plant. Uh, bacteria are going to be the most numerous microbes in this environment, and they're mostly associated with the leaves. Uh, most of the research, this has been going on for close to a century now, if not more, and our, our impetus for looking at bacteria in this environment really comes from the phytopathogen or the plant pathogen side of things. And so we have a fairly good understanding of uh, their life phases in association, in association with their host plants, um, both epiphytically, where they're not really causing any, any disease uh, or causing any harm to the host plant, but if they are able to then invade into the leaf interior, uh, if there's a compatible interaction with their host plant, they can replicate and cause disease there. And we know a number of things that regulate bacterial populations in this environment. So up here I'm showing things like desiccation stress, UV irradiation, as well as the ability to access nutrients. So microbes are not, or bacteria in particular, are not uh, homogeneously distributed over the leaf surface. They're often found in these aggregates, either multi-species aggregates or uh, uh, single-species aggregates and they associate with particular uh, leaf structures, such as intracellular grooves or the bases of glandular trichomes. And these are essentially spots on the leaf surface where nutrients and water are available. Um, and, and again, they can be found in large, single or multi-species aggregates. And so this is just sort of a background of the microbiology of this environment. Now, thinking about from the phage perspective, we've been able to isolate phages from this environment, certainly but our understanding of bacteria, bacteriophage interactions here and how that affects each other's ecology is a largely unexplored question. Some people have started to look at this, and one researcher in particular uh, was recently in the UK but has now moved to Berkeley, Britt Koskela, has looked at bacteriophage dynamics within the horse chestnut uh, phylosphere. And some of the interesting findings that she has uh, come across is that there's local adaptation. So isolating bacteriophage from a particular tree, they're going to be more likely to infect bacteria isolated from that same tree than bacteria isolated from a separate tree. So there's local adaptation. Additionally, there's a temporal component here. So in this case, she uh, was using bacteriophage isolated in September and then comparing that to, or challenging that against bacteria isolated either contemporaneously in September or from previous time points. And what you can see is that the bacteriophage were most competent against bacteria that had been isolated pre the month previously, indicating, again, there's both spatial and temporal dynamics with adaptation in this environment. So I got in, uh, found myself in this field in sort of a circuitous route. I actually was starting to look at intraspecies competition between Pseudomonas syringi strains, because we anticipate that there will be, a, or we know that there's a lot of competition in the phylosphere for um, locations and for nutrients. And so I was looking to find some uh, chemically mediated antagonism between these different strains that we've isolated. So basically, strains that are competing for uh, niche space. So I found a number of uh, compounds, um, or rather an array of activity, so these are, what I'm showing here are just plates, lawns of bacteria, as many of you are probably familiar with, obviously. Um, and the clearing zones are all coming from supernatants from other strains that I've spotted onto these bacterial lawns. Now what I want to stress now is that 99% of these clearing zones are not bacteriophage derived. Um, so these are mostly, probably many people here are familiar with bacteriosins, and these are all coming mostly from a bacteriosin um, source. So there was a diversity of killing spectra across the 18 or so strains that I was working with, and I was interested then in pursuing the genetic basis within one strain that's sort of been a heavy workhorse in this field for about the past 30 years, uh, what I'll just refer to as B728A. Well, it had a number of predicted um, bacteriosin or colosin-like bacteriosins within its genome, but after deleting all of those, I found that there was actually no loss of killing activity uh, from this strain. So these are the three strains 
that B728A will kill. Uh, this is the wild type. Looking um, for other, since I knew it was mitomycin C inducible, I started looking at different prophage regions, and there was one prophage region uh, that looked to be defunct. It, didn't, it was lacking a lot of genes that uh, would be necessary for replication. And so I started making deletions within this region. Uh, so deletion of a regulator from this prophage region abolishes killing activity and is complementable. Deletion of genes necessary for the phage tail biosynthesis results in abolished killing activity. And then deletion of the receptor binding protein also results in abolished killing activity. It is complementable, and uh, the plasmid-only control didn't complement. Okay? So uh, what I could say now is that the prophage region that is a defunct prophage region is actually encoding a bacteriophage-derived uh, toxin. And many people are probably familiar with the R-type and the F-type piacins produced by Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and so these sorts of structures have been uh, characterized before. The interesting thing, however, is when I started comparing uh, these two strains, thinking, well, probably this is coming from the same source, right? Uh, what I'm showing here is just a genomic comparison between Pseudomonas syringi and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Um, this pink trace here indicates that there is nucleotide identity between the two strains, so we're looking at a syntenic region within the genome. Um, all of the pink boxes are also indicating that the proteins, as you might expect, are also homologous and have a high degree of identity. However, for the two phage toxins, or for the phage toxin region between the two, there's little to no nucleotide identity, and all the proteins found in this region, as you might also expect, uh, share very little homology with each other, and so they look like they're coming from different sources. And so this is sort of the question that I wanted to follow up on. Is this an independent uh, uh, independently derived event. The evidence so far suggested this is the case. Comparing them to their putative uh, progenitor phages, the originosa toxin is derived from P2 or a P2-like progenitor, whereas the toxin from Pseudomonas syringia is derived from a phage mu or mu-like progenitor. And then uh, doing some phylogenetic reconstruction. Uh, I found three different proteins that I could actually link among all of the members here, so for the two phage toxins as well as their progenitor phages. And what I found in every case is that the phage P2 homolog uh, clustered with Pseudomonas originosa, whereas the phage mu homolog clustered in a well-supported clade with B728A again. So, I take this as, as uh, essentially strong evidence that yes, these are toxins are essentially derived independently of each other. Um, so here we have multiple levels of convergence occurring. So both at the syntenic region, they're both ending up within the same region within the genome uh, of their respective bacterium. Uh, phenotypic convergence as well, where we've gone from a replicative bacteriophage to now just the phage tail uh, that's acting as a selective toxin. And again, and lastly, a, a genomic convergence as well. And as I mentioned, uh, originally in the description for the piacin or the phage toxin in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, only the genes necessary for tail morphogenesis were retained. Um, so going from phage P2 or P2-like progenitor to the phage toxin. And the same is true for Pseudomonas ringi as well. So comparing the genes that are retained in this toxin region back to bacteriophage mu, we can see that only those genes that are associated with the tail are retained. And so now thinking general, generally about where this research goes, and uh, I think we'll have more stories of what I'm referring to as basically a domesticated bacteriophage, right? So it's a bacteriophage that's no longer acting as an independent entity, but has been co-opted by its host bacterium. So how common are these? What I'm showing here are just uh, the phylogeny for bacteria and the number of descriptions of bacteriophage-like toxins that have been described, most of them in gamma proteobacteria, but um, I imagine that there's many more cases where this has occurred in other clades as well. And what are the ecological factors that um, favor this domestication? So what are the, what's the context in which we go from having a replicative bacteriophage to some bacteriophage-derived element. 
And then lastly, thinking about the mutational events that get us to this point. So I imagine there's you know, 100 different ways in which you can break a phage and it no longer replicates as a phage. But then thinking about that one way in which you can break it, but it still has some function useful for its host bacterium. So now I'll just finish up with um, some recent work where I've been looking at the resistance to this toxin from different strains that are targeted by it. And so I want to highlight these two strains here, PPH and PGY. Uh, one, you'll notice that um, on the left side here, they're closely related to each other and their sensitivity spectra are identical. So anything that kills PPH will also kill PGY. Uh, however, their dynamics of resistance are noticeably different. And so here, um, what I'm looking, what we're looking at, just to walk you through this, uh, we're looking at the log CFU reduction of a culture either treated with sterile medium or treated with medium containing the particular toxin. And so for wild type PPH, we can see that there's around a 10,000 fold reduction when it's treated with this particular toxin, or at least from this particular prep. And for 10 replicate populations that initially had no detectable resistance in it, I let them grow up and then treated them, isolated single colonies, and then retested them for resistance. We can see that there's a fair amount of durable resistance that's gained for PPH. However, for one of my replicate cultures, uh, the colony that I derived from that didn't have any durable resistance. So it was still just as sensitive to the toxin as the wild type strain was. Conversely, for PGY, however, we can see that the exact opposite um, has occurred, where the resistance or the sensitivity to the toxin for those that were already treated uh, certainly didn't decrease. And in this case, it looks like they increased, but I think that was just uh, an artifact of this particular experiment. I've done this several times, and I see the same trend where uh, isolates from PGY that have been treated with the, with the toxin don't have any durable resistance. They're still just as sensitive as the progenitor was. Um, so now showing a similar graph here, the same thing, wild type PPH. Uh, these three strains were all treated with the toxin. This strain uh, didn't gain durable resistance, but the other two did. Now when I take these and infiltrate those into their host plants, what we can see is that for the two strains, BRM16 and BRM12, they have a noticeable reduction in their ability to proliferate within their host plant. So there's going to be a fitness trade-off in their virulence and, uh, towards their host plant. But interestingly, for those strains uh, that don't gain durable resistance, at least when treated, they grow to just about the same as the wild type levels within their host plant. And so I don't think that this is a coincidence. And certainly I've seen this, this is, I'm showing data for PPH here, but I've seen the same thing for the other strain for PGY. Those isolates that don't have durable resistance don't have any trade-off, whereas those isolates that do happen to have durable resistance do have a trade-off. And so I think that, again, this is not a coincidence, indicating that um, this uh, intramicrobial interaction is important and that they've evolved strategies to basically evade the toxin, but at the same time not having to pay the cost of being resistant. So uh, thinking again now about future perspectives from this work, uh, one thing that we think about in phylosphere microbiology that may be different than a number of other fields of microbiology is that these environments are ephemeral, right? So for perennial plants that uh, lose their leaves annually or for um, annual plants, Right, you have to start essentially from scratch every growing season. And so you have to get uh, the inoculum source, and we know about this for bacteria, but the question is, uh, the phage inoculum, where is that coming from? Where is the holdover? Um, and additionally, uh, both in this field, but also thinking about more generally, the, this uh, effect of phage-derived toxins on phage ecology. So, by using these toxins or even other toxins that are not phage derived in terms of poaching the hosts. So intermicrobial competition uh, affecting, again, different trophic levels. And then lastly, the ubiquity and then the cause of the resistant trade-off. So for a number of these mutants that I've isolated, I'll, I will be sequencing them to identify the mutations and, and ferret out why there is this particular trade-off, which um, to this point has not really been described, at least in this field. 
So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, this work I've done in collaboration with my postdoctoral mentor, uh, Dr. Baltris at the University of Arizona. Uh, I've also collaborated with Tanya Renner on this for the phylogenetics, and I've had a number of members from the lab, undergraduates and other lab members, who have assisted with this work, and then uh, support for this work was provided both by startup funds to uh, Dr. Baltris as well as uh, USDA. And with that, I'll take any questions.